The internet is a vast place. Nearly any question that comes to mind can be answered with a simple keystroke. Any curiosity can be quelled with a simple search term. And yet, when we hit enter and look upon the very answer we sought out to find, many of us experience a very peculiar kind of cognitive dissonance. The answer you sought out is grotesque and disturbing. And yet, you can't look away, and you don't know why. It's almost like coming to grips with our morbid reality is a task fit for no one. In the U.S. state of Washington, Seattle is its most populous city. The city has well over 700,000 residents and a very developed tech industry. Many major tech companies in the United States have their businesses headquartered there. And as a result, many people migrate to the city with the intention of establishing a career in said industry. This is Janavi Kandula. She was 23 years old and was pursuing a master's degree in information systems. For much of her childhood, her mother pushed her to be educated, and this was a difficult endeavor. Her mom only made $200 a day, and most of that money would go towards supporting her education in India. And when she was offered the opportunity to go to college in the United States, specifically Northeastern University, Janavi took it, and she thrived. Everyone who knew her described her as brilliant and expected big things from her. But unfortunately, on the night of January 23rd, 2023, while walking on a crosswalk, her dreams and aspirations would come to a violent end. Seattle officer Kevin Dave chirps his police sirens. The roar of his engine heard on his body camera. His speedometer shows acceleration up to 74 miles per hour, responding to a priority one call, but within seconds. Three Mary two. Start a supervisor, start fire for a struck pedestrian. Is that the same location, sir? Negative. Janavi Kandula was in the crosswalk at the Thomas and Dexter intersection when Dave's patrol car hit her. King County Prosecuting Attorney's Office released the video after Fox 13's public records request. First published by Public Cola, the video shows Dave performing CPR on Kandula moments after hitting her as several first responders start showing up. You all right? No, I'm not all right. The video you just saw was of a police officer named Kevin Dave who was responding to a priority one drug overdose call. He was well over the speed limit, approximately 74 miles per hour. And while driving at this high rate of speed, he struck and killed Janavi Kandula. Kevin Dave would quickly get out of his patrol car and try to resuscitate Janavi with CPR. Once realizing his efforts were in vain, he would contact other police officers over his radio with the intentions of requesting for help. After Kevin was taken away from the scene, he would be quickly informed that there would be a criminal investigation into this accident. The Seattle Police Department would make a statement pointing out that police officers are allowed to speed and run red lights in the case of a priority one call, but they wanted to reassure the citizens of Seattle that there would be a proper investigation into Janavi's death. And for a moment, that was the entire story. While tragic and devastating, clearly it was an accident and the Seattle Police Department were going to do their best to make things right. That was the popular opinion of citizens in Seattle, until this video was shared online. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep, totally. All right, brother. Uh, well, uh... Yep. Um, I'm sure, uh... TCIS is. And, uh... Oh, he's good. He says, well, normally we don't give voluntary statements. And I said, hey, you're going to have to decide if you wanted to give a statement or not. But it does not seem like there's a criminal investigation going on. Otherwise, there would be other... What's that? Yeah. Otherwise, there might be other people arriving, correct? Yeah, I mean... He's going 50. That's not out of control. That's not reckless for a train driver. Yeah, lights and sirens. Yeah. 
Yeah, well, there's some. Um, the, initially, uh, he said she was in a crosswalk. Uh, there's a witness that says, no, she wasn't. But that witness could be different because I don't think she was thrown 40 feet either. Uh, I think she went up on the hood, hit the windshield. Then when he hit the brakes, flew off the car. But she is dead. <laughs> No, it's a regular person. Yeah. Yeah, just write a check. Just... Yeah. <laughs> $11,000. She was 26 anyway. She had limited value. Detective Daniel Auditor was the police officer who was speaking about Janavi Kundula in his patrol car. He's a drug recognition officer who was assigned to determine whether David was under the influence when he struck Janavi. He concluded that his colleague was sober, and quickly after that, he called the police officer's guild president, Mike Salon. That was the conversation that was captured on his body cam by accident. In fact, many people think that the video wasn't supposed to be found, and the only reason why it was found was because the Seattle Police Department was pushed to do a thorough routine check of police body cam footage concerning Janavi's death. After his police body cam footage was released online, many people were appalled with Daniel's statements. So much so, he was motivated to go onto the radio to explain to the public why he said what he said. The host of KTTHAM, Jason Rance, reported that he obtained a written statement from Daniel Auditor, and it said the following. I intended the comment as mockery of lawyers, Auditor wrote. I laughed at the ridiculousness of how these incidents are litigated, and the ridiculousness of how I watched these incidents play out as two parties bargain over a tragedy. After that statement, Daniel Auditor has said nothing else to the media to explain his actions. Kevin Dave, the police officer that struck Janavi, has also remained out of the public eye and has made zero statements to the media. When interviewed about this tragedy and subsequent comments made about Janavi's death, Janavi Kandula's parents had nothing to say, except, I wonder if these men's daughters or granddaughters have value. Janavi Kandula was scheduled to graduate in December of this year. This is Syndrome. It's a 2010 graphic novel about a neuropathologist who wants to cure a serial killer. The main character uses a movie studio style set to understand what makes a serial killer kill. The comic book isn't very good. It has 3.8 stars on Amazon and the only reason why anyone is aware of this comic book is because of its author. This is Blake LaBelle. Born May 8th, 1981, he's a trust fund kid who used his ample amount of money to become a comic book author and a movie director. His father, Lauren LaBelle, was in the Canadian Motorsport Hall of Fame and a sailor in the 1976 Montreal Summer Olympics. He'd become a billionaire later in life through real estate and made his fortune building homes in Toronto. Adding to the family wealth was Blake LaBelle's mother, Eleanor an heiress who died in 2011, leaving behind $12 million, which was split between her two sons, Blake and Cody. So it goes without saying that Blake LaBelle was flush. He had an $18,000 a month trust fund payment on top of having $6 million that he inherited from his mother. And with those resources and his father's connections, Blake would go on to create Syndrome, a teenage comedy film called Bald, and a TV show that he directed called Spaceballs, the animated series. Out of all of his creative endeavors, his graphic novel Syndrome was his favorite, and the most personal. He would heavily promote his comic book at multiple comic conventions, and many people didn't like it. They found the book to be gross and overly edgy, because the comic book's content was nothing but gore, with the worst panel in particular depicting a decapitated woman naked on a bed. While he was promoting this comic book, he would go on to meet his future wife, Iana Kaizen. They met in 2015 and began a romantic relationship. And unfortunately for Iana, LaBelle's life was coming apart as his mental health became increasingly unstable. Blake LaBelle's friends and associates would always assert that he was eccentric and weird, but overall a good guy who's just a bit quiet. But suddenly his behavior and mental state changed when he started dating Iana. 
his Ukrainian mistress. You see, Blake LaBelle was already in a committed relationship with a woman named Amanda Braun and was also the mother to his two children. And suddenly, he just abandoned them to pursue a relationship with Iana. Iana Kaizen immediately became pregnant and the couple were soon engaged. What Iana didn't know was that along with the ongoing stress of the divorce with his previous wife and the challenges of adjusting to his new relationship with Kaizen, Blake was also carrying on an affair with a colleague named Constance. And when Blake tried to cut that relationship off, Constance would go to the police claiming that Blake LaBelle had SA'd her. This allegation was taken seriously and Blake LaBelle was held in prison with a $100,000 bail. And after that bail was posted, Blake and Iana's relationship began to break down even more. On May 24th, 2016, shortly after Kaizen and LaBelle became engaged, and three weeks after Iana had given birth to their daughter, Olga, Iana's mother, went looking for her after being unable to contact her, even after making more than 10 calls. The day before, Iana had gone shopping for strollers for the baby. It was the last time Olga would see her daughter alive. When Olga got the police involved, two police officers attempted to conduct a search of Iana's apartment. They knocked on the door, but left after no one answered. On another occasion, Olga went to the apartment alone and stood across the street yelling at LaBelle to open the door. She would testify that she saw him approach the window only to close it and disappear inside. It would take two days before law enforcement officers had a warrant to search Iana's apartment. Immediately after entering, they saw Iana's lifeless body laying right next to Blake LaBelle. He was asleep. Prosecutors said there were indications that he had been laying next to her body, which had been cleaned for some time before the police arrived. Iana was found mutilated, drained of blood, and lying in their bed. Blake LaBelle was subsequently charged with murder, torture, mayhem, and aggravated mayhem, to which he pleaded not guilty to. An autopsy report was released on September 20th, 2017, listing Iana's causes of death as exsanguination and head trauma. During the coroner's deposition, he had this to say. Iana Kaizen's entire scalp was traumatically absent and was not found. It was not present with the body. Her skull had been stripped down to the surface of the bone. There was no scalp present except for little bits in the back of the neck. Portions of the right side of her face were torn away, including the right ear and part of her posterior face on the side and all the way down to the jawline. There were quite a number of bruises and abrasions on the face, primarily on the left side, the left cheek and left jaw area. A number of bruises and abrasions, including one that turned out to be a human bite mark. She had lived for at least eight hours approximately after receiving the scalp injury and the bruise to the collarbone. I have never seen this before, and I doubt if hardly any forensic pathologists in this country or abroad have ever seen this outside of perhaps wartime. It's extremely rare. On June 20th, 2018, LaBelle was convicted of first degree murder, torture, and aggravated mayhem. On June 26, 2018, he was sentenced to life in prison without parole. News media reported the crime as grisly and possibly the most gruesome murder in the history of Hollywood, if not Los Angeles. This is the Hart family. From left to right, we have Sierra, Sarah, Hannah, Marcus, Abigail, Devante, Jennifer, and Jeremiah. Jennifer and Sarah Hart are married, and they've been together since 2009. Both women majored in elementary education in college, with Sarah focusing on special education. Sarah would be the only one to complete their education, though. Jennifer would follow Sarah to Minnesota, where they would move in together, and five years later, they would be married. And during their time together, conversation about having children grew. This dream would be stifled by the fact that they would move from home to home frequently. If they wanted to start a family, they would need to set some roots. Both Jennifer and Sarah's parents were against them fostering any children. Most of their gripes were because of their sexual orientation, and this disagreement led both Sarah and Jennifer to estrange themselves from their parents. The first child that Sarah and Jennifer fostered was a 15-year-old girl, and the couple did not like her. They complained about the girl's issues openly, and after being interviewed five years later, she remembered how Jen and Sarah told her of their plans to adopt three more children and how she could be a big sister to them. 
but suddenly after that conversation, the 15-year-old girl would be dropped off at her therapist for an appointment where she would be informed that Sarah and Jennifer would no longer be her parents and would not be coming back to get her. A few years after abandoning this 15-year-old girl at a therapist appointment, Sarah and Jennifer decided to adopt six children. In the state of Texas obliged, Marcus, Hannah, and Abigail were the first three to be picked up at the ages of seven, four, and two. Two years later, Devante, Jeremiah, and Sierra were picked up at the ages of five, four, and three. Sarah and Jennifer really liked the look of their family, with all of their adopted children being of different races and both Sarah and Jennifer being in a committed relationship, their family aligned with their political ideologies. This would lead them to post many photos about their life and their philosophies that guide it. And on the outside, everything seemed fine. Sarah worked and Jennifer was a stay-at-home mom, and on top of the money that they were receiving from the Texas state government, the children were more than taken care of. But over time, cracks started to appear in this wholesome facade. After adopting all of the children in Texas, Sarah and Jennifer Hart would move back to Minnesota. And while still living in Minnesota in September of 2008, their daughter Hannah went to school with bruising on her arm. When asked by a teacher about the marks, the little girl said that her parents whipped her with a belt. No charges were filed, but the Hearts took all six of their children out of the school for nearly a year before re-enrolling them in the following fall. Two years after this incident, in November of 2010, teachers noticed signs of abuse on six-year-old Abigail Hart and alerted authorities. The girl told investigators that her mother Jen had held her head under cold water and punched her because they believed she had stolen a penny that they found on her. When authorities became involved, all children claimed that they had been spanked constantly and deprived of food. Sarah took responsibility for the abuse, pled guilty to assault, and was sentenced to community service for one year. A year later, Hannah reportedly told a school nurse that she had not eaten all day. Sarah claimed that Hannah was merely playing the food card and recommended that she just be given water. Soon afterward, all six children were taken out of public schools and were homeschooled from then on. The only way the public would know anything about these children were through Sarah and Jennifer's Facebook accounts, where this image was posted. It's a picture of 12-year-old Devante hugging a police officer. The photograph was taken during a protest in Portland, Oregon in 2014. The image became known as the hug felt around the world. And Jennifer was very active on her social media and used Facebook to project an image of a loving, happy family while also sharing her thoughts on race, politics, and trips that the family went on. Little did anyone know that just a year prior to this picture being taken, the Hart family had moved from Minnesota to Oregon, and Oregon law enforcement were notified of the abuse allegations that happened back in Minnesota. Their investigated included separate interviews of everyone in the family. Two family friends stated that the children were forced to raise their hands before speaking, could not wish each other happy birthday, and could not laugh at the dinner table. There were other reports that the children were poorly fed and looked small for their ages. One family friend reported that Jennifer had ordered a pizza for the children, but each was only allowed to have a small slice. When Jennifer discovered the pizza was gone, she punished the children by not feeding them breakfast and forcing them to lie on their bed for five hours. Unfortunately, the interviews of the children themselves revealed no new incidents of abuse, nor did they mention anything that happened in Minnesota. When Jennifer herself was interviewed, she claimed that any family problems were the results of others not being tolerant to two lesbian mothers with six African-American children. In 2017, the Hart family would move for a third time. Sarah and Jennifer moved the family to Woodland, Washington. And one night, around 1.30 a.m., Hannah Hart jumped out of her second-story bedroom window and approached the residence of her next-door neighbors, the DeKalbs. Hannah reportedly pleaded, Please don't make me go back. They're racist. They abuse us. Soon afterwards, the Harts found Hannah and took her back home. The following day, Jennifer attempted to explain the incident by claiming Hannah was lying, that the children occasionally acted out because they were drug babies, and that Hannah's biological mother was bipolar. After this incident, the DeKalb family came into contact with Devante, who constantly begged for food and asked the DeKalbs not to tell Jennifer about these requests. In later conversations with Devante, he told them that his adoptive mothers withheld food as punishment and that the children were sometimes abused. This, combined with the earlier incident with Hannah, made the DeKalbs report the hearts to both the police and the Washington State Department of Social and Health Services. But it was too late. On March 26, 2018, Jennifer and Sarah Hart murdered all six of the children when Jennifer drove their vehicle, a GMC Yukon XL, over a 100-foot cliff 
on California State Route 1 in Mendocino County. The bodies of the five children, Hannah, Marcus, Jeremiah, Abigail, and Sierra, were found in or around the vehicle, which had landed upside down on a beach below the cliff. The body of Devante has not been found as of 2023. All of the children had high levels of diphenhydramine in their systems, otherwise known as Benadryl, and there were previous Google searches made on the Hart's computers asking how much diphenhydramine was necessary to overdose. A toxicology report noted that Jennifer's blood alcohol content was well over the legal limit, and that Sarah had high levels of diphenhydramine in her system. Expert analysis of the SUV's internal airbag deploying computer determined that the Yukon had intentionally driven over the edge of the cliff from a standing stop, accelerating to 20 miles per hour in three seconds with a throttle at 100%. This is Greenwood Cemetery, located in Atlanta, Georgia. It was chartered and established in 1904, and it cost $100,000 to develop. There are multiple sections of this cemetery, two of the most prominent being the Greek and Chinese sections of the cemetery. This place is infamous because it's the final resting place of a few notable people. Samuel Truett Cathy was laid to rest at this cemetery on September 8th, 2014, and he was the founder and CEO of Chick-fil-A. The other notable character to be laid to rest here was Hank Ballard. He was the lead vocalist of the Midnighters and was one of the first rock and rollers to emerge in the early 1950s, with a few of his hit singles being Work With Me Annie and The Twist. While those two people are pretty notable, their stories aren't the ones I wanna share with you. I wanna tell you this person's story. Her name is Lena Evans, and her tombstone isn't as easy to find as theirs. On November 16th, 1928, a news story was made about her, and it's going to shed light on how she ended up in this cemetery. Wife dies of poison while crying in vain for missing husband. Without seeing the husband for whom she cried during her dying hours, Miss Lena Fortson, 1070 Dill Avenue, died Friday morning at Grady Hospital from poison, which she took on November 9th. She had been in the hospital since, lingering between life and death. Thursday, she broke the silence that had attended her illness since she took the poison and told her relatives she took the tablets when she discovered that her husband, Julian Fortson, was paying attention to another. Despite that statement, during her dying hours, she constantly called for the husband, who had disappeared. Relatives made efforts to locate him without avail. Funeral arrangements will be announced later. In Japan, the southernmost prefecture is Okinawa, and it has a population of 14 million people, and a geographic area of 880 square miles. And located there is Camp Hansen, a U.S. military base. The base is home to the central training area, which includes several firing ranges, a pair of shooting houses which support live firing, and other training areas being one of the few locations on the island where weapons firing is permitted. Also at Camp Hansen is a brig, a confinement facility that houses U.S. military members from around the Far East for short-term sentences. This U.S. military base, while sounding typical, isn't. It holds a very terrible reputation. And a spotlight was cast on that terrible reputation in 1995, when three U.S. servicemen were found guilty of one of the most gruesome crimes to ever happen in Okinawa. On September 4th, 1995, Navy servicemen Marcus Gill and U.S. Marines Rodico Harp and Kendrick Ledette, all serving at Camp Hansen in Okinawa, rented a van and kidnapped a 12-year-old Okinawan girl. They beat her, duct taped her eyes and mouth shut, and bound her hands. Gill and Harp then assaulted her, while Ledette claimed he only pretended to assault her in fear of retribution from Gill. The offenders were tried and convicted in a Japanese court by Japanese law, and all three men received 10 years each, which were the maximum sentences for their crimes. Their families also paid a monetary reparation to the family of the victim, a common practice in Japan. But that's not the end of the story. When these crimes occurred in 1995, the photographs of the suspects' faces had been virtually absent from Japan's media. News organizations in Japan were concerned over the public's actions if they were to find out that the people responsible for this kidnapping and assault were black. They didn't want to perpetuate racist overtones, and it didn't help that the U.S. military public affairs officer didn't cooperate with the news organizations, saying that he couldn't disclose the suspects' races out of respect for their privacy. 
After the incident became known, public outrage began, especially over the U.S.-Japan Status of Forces Agreement, which gives the U.S. service members a certain level of extraterritoriality, or exemption from jurisdiction of local law, only as it relates to the place that the suspects were detained. While the crime was committed away from a U.S. military base, the U.S. initially took the men into custody on September 6th, although false rumors spread that the suspects were free to roam the base and had been seen eating hamburgers. This wasn't true. The suspects were, in fact, held in a military brig until the Japanese officials charged them with the crime. Despite an immediate request by Japanese law enforcement for custody and eventual trial, the men were only transferred on September 29th. This delay was in conformity with the status forces agreement between the United States and Japan, but it still caused social unrest because many Okinawan citizens felt that these U.S. servicemen weren't being treated as criminals. Eventually, the U.S. servicemen would be placed in Japanese custody, but the Okinawan people did not stop their protest. That was because U.S. Navy Admiral Richard C. Mack, while talking about the assault on television at a conference, said, quote, I think this was absolutely stupid. I have said several times, for the price they paid to rent the car used in the crime, they could have bought a girl or a prostitute. These remarks were condemned as insensitive, and Mack was dismissed from his post and forced into early retirement. After the conference, much of the protesting calmed down, and over the years, these three men served their prison terms in Japanese prisons. All three men were released early in 2003. I'm sure many of you guys have gone to a funeral of a loved one. I'm sure many of you have gone through the process of talking to a funeral director to try and figure out the best way to celebrate your loved one's life, and most importantly, to make sure that they look their best. John J. McManus and Son's funeral home is in that very business, and you can see their sentiment right on their front page. For over a hundred years, we have strived to make sure that every family receives the care, attention, and sensitivity we would expect for our loved ones. Care, attention, and sensitivity. Those are the exact sentiments that I and many others would expect any funeral home to uphold. So it really begs the question why John McManus and Son's funeral home chose to neglect the body of Regina Kristoff. That's all I remember is that monster being in that coffin, not my daughter. Chantal Jean's last memory of her deceased daughter has become a living nightmare. Her skin was all off. It wasn't even connected to her face anymore. She had two garbage bags put on her feet. The images of Regina Kristoff at her wake at McManus Funeral Home on July 9th are just too disturbing to show you. I saw that her face was caved in. And the service too much for this family to bear. A rotting body, that's what it smelled like. Regina Kristoff, who died in her sleep at 37 years old on June 24th, 2023, had a lawsuit filed on her behalf by her family. This was because her body was left unrecognizable because the funeral home neglected to embalm the body in time for the wake. After a short investigation, evidence strongly suggests that she had not been embalmed for two weeks. The attorney suing on behalf of Regina Kristoff claimed that there were maggots crawling out from under her eyelids and her body was partially wrapped in garbage bags. Attorney Kurt Robinson was quoted saying, apart from all, it was just an incredible stench of a decomposing body that permeated the funeral home. It doesn't look like a person at all. It looks like a mud monster. Kristoff's mother, during the wake, had to prevent her daughter's two children from viewing the body and had to escort them out of the room because of the stench. Unfortunately, the visual of her decomposing daughter deeply scarred her. After finding out what was done to her daughter's body, she had developed depression and she had to seek counseling. This is Rebecca Lucille Schaefer. Born on November 6, 1967 in Eugene, Oregon, she was the only child of Jewish parents Donna Schaefer, a writer and instructor who taught at the Willamette University and Portland Community College, and Dr. Benson Schaefer, a child psychologist. For much of her childhood, she was raised in Portland, Oregon, where she attended Lincoln High School, and during her years in school, she developed an interest in modeling. She appeared in department store catalogs and television commercials. In 1984, when she was 16, she worked a summer in New York City with elite model management, and with her parents' permission, stayed in the city to pursue modeling. 
She was out there all by herself and putting in a lot of work. While studying at the professional's children's school, she managed to get a short-term role on the daytime soap opera Guiding Light. That gave her enough experience to audition for a more serious role on ABC's One Life to Live, and she landed the role of Annie Barnes. And that role lasted for six months. She was steadily building her acting career, all while her success in modeling started to wane. She just wasn't tall enough. She even moved to Japan for a little bit to try and jumpstart her modeling career there, but she encountered the same issues with her height and her weight. In 1986, after moving back to New York City to focus on her acting career, Schaefer won a small role in Woody Allen's comedy Radio Days. Her appearance in that TV show was brief. A lot of the major scenes she was in were cut out, but it wouldn't be long until her career started to really pick up. She appeared on the cover of Seventeen magazine, which caught the attention of TV producers who were casting for a comedy called My Sister Sam. She won the role as Patricia, or Patty Russell, a teenager who moves from Oregon to San Francisco to live with her 29-year-old sister, Samantha, after the death of their parents. The show in its first season was pretty popular, but canceled halfway through its second season. After that, Rebecca would get supporting roles in many movies, with the last movie she worked on being The End of Innocence. While Rebecca was improving her craft and growing her acting career, a man named Robert John Bardo was watching all of it. Born January 2nd, 1970, Bardo was the youngest of seven children. His mother was Korean and his father was a non-commissioned officer in the United States Air Force. The family moved frequently and had settled in Tucson, Arizona in 1983. Bardo reportedly had a troubled childhood. He was abused by one of his siblings, and that abuse led him to being placed into foster care. His whole family had a history of mental illness, and he was diagnosed with bipolar disorder. At the age of 15, he was institutionalized for a month to treat emotional problems. He then dropped out of his high school in the ninth grade and picked up work as a janitor at Jack in the Box. Between working there and going home, Bardo developed an obsession. He would develop parasocial relationships with women that he would see on television, and he would attempt to stalk them. His first obsession was with a peace activist named Samantha Smith, who died in a plane crash in 1985. He then wrote numerous letters to Rebecca Schaefer, one of which she actually answered. In 1987, he traveled to Los Angeles hoping to meet Schaefer on the set of My Sister Sam, but Warner Brothers secretly turned him away. He returned a month later armed with a knife, but security guards again prevented him from gaining access. He returned to his native town of Tucson, Arizona, and lost focus on Schaefer for a little bit while his obsession shifted towards pop singers Tiffany, Debbie Gibson, and Madonna. That obsession wouldn't last long because Bardo would eventually watch the black comedy scenes from Class Struggle, which Rebecca Schaefer starred in. There was one scene in particular where she was pictured in bed with another actor and he became enraged from that scene, apparently out of jealousy, and decided that Schaefer should be punished for becoming, quote, another Hollywood whore. Around the time Bardo developed this obsession with Rebecca Schaefer, another stalker named author Richard Jackson had stabbed actress Teresa Saldana in 1982. Bardo learned that Jackson had used a private investigator to obtain Saldana's address. Bardo then paid a detective agency in Tucson $250 to find Schaefer's home address in California. His brother then helped him get a Ruger GP100, and from there, Bardo traveled to Los Angeles a third time and roamed the neighborhood where Schaefer lived, asking people if she actually lived there. Once he was certain that the address was correct, he rang the doorbell. Schaefer was preparing for an audition for The Godfather Part 3 and was expecting a script to be delivered, so she answered the door. Bardo showed her a letter and autograph that she had previously sent him with a short conversation. She asked him to never come to her home again. From there, he left, went to a diner nearby, had breakfast, and then returned to her apartment an hour later. Bardo then said she answered the door with a cold look on her face. He then pulled out the handgun and shot her in the chest at point-blank range in the doorway of her apartment building. According to Bardo, she fell and only said, why? She would be quickly rushed to the emergency room of Cedar sinai Medical Center, where she was pronounced dead 30 minutes after her arrival. Tucson Police Chief Peter Ronstadt arrested Bardo the next day after motorists reported a man running through traffic on Interstate 10. He immediately confessed to the murder. Bardo was convicted of first-degree aggravated murder in a bench trial and was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. As a result of this incident, federal law regarding the release of personal information through the DMV was changed. The Driver's Privacy Protection Act, which prevents the DMV from releasing private addresses, was enacted in 1994.
This is Strava, a fitness app that helps users track their running and cycling performance. It gathers information from your smartphone or smartwatch and uploads it to your account automatically. So not only you can track your fitness stats, but share it with your friends. And Sam Norton was an avid user of this app. He was a marathon runner, and the most recent marathon that he ran was located in Santa Rosa, California. It was a 10K. And unfortunately, before he could even finish the race, he collapsed and died, specifically at the 23rd mile. He was taken to a hospital where he was later pronounced dead, and details about his case of death were not available until Monday, though he was diagnosed with a rare condition earlier this year. This was a shock to all of his loved ones, and his mother was devastated. She was quoted saying, he died doing something that he loved. He loves to challenge himself, and that was very true. You see, Sam was using this marathon to qualify for the 2024 Boston Marathon, and he wanted to capture his progress on the Strava app. But unfortunately, along with his pace and map of where he was running, his heartbeat was captured too. And right here, you can see the very moment he collapsed and died, and when Strava uploaded all of that information to the website for all of his friends to see. What's up everyone, it's your boy Aleris, aka Panda Daddy, and I hope you enjoyed today's video. And if you did, let me know in the comments down below, and leave a like if you liked the video. And if you're new to my channel, go ahead and subscribe fam. What you doing watching videos and not subscribing? And for old, make sure you hit that bell so you get these notifications every time. I know you guys have been waiting for the newest installment to the Morbid Reality series, and I genuinely hope that you guys enjoyed today's video. Over time, this video series has become more and more complex, and it's required more and more research, and I really appreciate you guys being patient with me and showing support when the video is finally uploaded and as always gotta thank the patreon supporters that make content like this possible a big thank you to afk junkie zenith 2a mr sandman mike sleepy dragon power lover sherry morrison tron destroy 23 fit chivalry code connor purvis s16 squish rare days mr bean my golden experience james tucker bmx 30 cinnamon sticks scott the fake musician buckethead samantha bellhart admin faniker bloody hunter keely dunder nas hawk swiss patreon user and noah thank you so much for your support it is greatly appreciated and if you want to help support the channel there's two links in the description one in my merch store and one in my patreon both funds go directly into the channel so we can maintain what's happening here and as always stay zesty <laughs>